Okay, folks, so this is uh, paper one, May 2017, uh, time zone two. So we're going to go through the first one to ten questions in this video, and then we'll do the other subsequent videos. Turn it over, got our periodic table, could be useful. So we'll come back to put that over here. And then, of course, we're in calculations, chapter one to start with. So question one, what is the sum of the coefficients when the equation is balanced with whole numbers? It's a combustion equation, albeit incomplete combustion, because we're getting carbon monoxide. These are nice and easy to work out. So if you've got eight carbons there, that's enough to make eight carbon monoxides. Okay. Let's sort out how many waters. We've got 18 hydrogens here. You get two per molecule, so 18 divided by two, that's nine waters. And now let's sort out the oxygens. So uh, eight plus uh, nine, uh, that comes to 17. So 17 divided by two would be eight and a half. Okay. Now, it wants some of the coefficients, we want whole numbers, uh, so we can't be having these fractions. Imagine that's probably going to give us the 26 and a half uh, when you added those together, but of course we want whole numbers, so the simplest way to get rid of a half is to times it by 2. Times that by 2, you times everything else by 2, so that becomes 2, that becomes 17, that becomes 16, and that becomes 18. If you play darts, it's easy enough a bit. 18 and 17, that's 35, 41, 51, 53. So they come to 53 in total. Number two, what is the maximum volume in decimeters cubed of carbon dioxide produced when one gram of calcium carbonate reacts with 20 centimeters cubed of two molar hydrochloric acid? And then we've got the equation here, and then we've got the molar volume of uh, gas. That's, of course, at STP, which is standard temperature and pressure. Uh, it'll be 273 Kelvin. Uh, I can never quite remember the equation, but you can use the units to help you. So if we call this MV, so MV equals, we've got volume divided by the number of moles. So of course we can rearrange that to find V. V equals MV, this molar volume as I call it, times N. Okay, because looks like we're going to want that going forward. Right, what do we know? We know we've got one gram of calcium carbonate and we've got 20 centimetres cubed of two molar hydrochloric acid. So I guess we really have, need to have a bit of a think at the moment as to which one of those is the limiting reactant. So the relative formula mass of calcium carbonate is 100. I know that, and it's written down here. You can see the approach they're taking in this one here is we're basically they're working out the number of moles of calcium carbonate. And then if we've got 1 divided by 100, well, that is 0 0.01 moles. 1 divided by 10 would be 0 0.1, 1 divided by 100 is 0 0.01. So if I've got 0 0.01 moles of calcium carbonate, how many moles of carbon dioxide can that make? Well, that can make the same amount, 0 0.01 moles because they're one-to-one uh, -one in the reaction stoichiometry. What about the HCl then? So for the HCl, we need this equation, N equals CV. So concentration times the volume. So that would be, concentration is two times, we've got to have that in decimeters cubed, of course, so that would need to be divided by a thousand, so that's 0 0.02. So that's gonna be 0 0.04 moles. So if I've got 0 0.04 moles of HCl, how many moles of carbon dioxide could that make? Well, that could make half that number because uh, it's a 2 to 1 ratio. So that would make 0 0.02 moles. So which one is limiting? Well, it's the calcium carbonate because that can make the least amount of carbon dioxide. So we know we can rule out these ones. We're not going to be needing uh, the uh, volume of uh, acid or we're not going to need the number of moles of acid. So what have we got here then? So what's the difference between them? Oh, so okay, this is basically if we had to times it by 2 to increase the number of moles by 2, we don't. Basically, this will work out the number of moles of calcium carbonate. The number of moles of carbon dioxide will be exactly the same because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So then we just multiply by the, the molar, value, uh, molar volume, 22.7. So we'll go with answer C. You can see why sometimes it's good to leave these until the end, because that was quite a lot of work. That's taking up time, and you don't want to be panicking at the start when you sort of know you've got the rest of the paper to go. So I would normally leave these until the end. Maybe a quick, brief glimpse through, just my subconscious is working on it, but I'd come back to these when I know how much time I've got left, because I've already been through in the paper. Which factors affect the molar volume of an ideal gas? I always find ideal gas a bit tricky myself, uh, sort of, but um, it's the idea, remember, that's a, like... Um, the gas molecules don't interact with each other at all in an ideal gas. There's no kind of intermolecular forces. So what would affect the molar volume of an ideal gas? Well, let's just sort of think what would affect the, uh, the volume itself. So this would be, I suppose, the volume of one mole of a gas. 
uh, well, pressure would affect it because obviously if you increase the pressure, that would decrease the volume of one mole of that gas. So pressure would affect it. Temperature would affect it because we talked about here, well, one mole of a gas has a volume of 22.7, whereas if it's at room temperature rather than zero degrees C, then it would be 24, this value. So temperature, as temperature increases, the volume of a gas increases. And then this one here, empirical formula, well, uh, that's basically just the simplest ratio, and it doesn't matter what gas it is, what its relative formula mass is, that's not going to affect the volume. It will affect the density, certainly, uh, but yeah, the empirical formula and molecular formula would have no effect on the, the volume, because most of a gas, remember, is empty space. So I'm not going to go with that one, so it's going to be one and two only. Okay, question four, so we're on to atomic structure now. So which electron transition emits radiation of the longest wavelength? And remember, longest wavelength means smallest energy, okay? Because remember, they go in opposite directions. So first of all, what's going to emit it? Well, that's going to be electrons falling back down. So I can rule out B and D because they are going to absorb radiation because they're going up. Uh, and then C is going to be a lower energy than A because, of course, A is in ultraviolet, uh, because there's a big jump in energy as you get further from the nucleus, the energy levels get closer together. Whereas here, of course, this is uh, visible, and there to there would be infrared. So C is going to be visible light as it falls from n equals 4 to n equals 2, which is going to be lower energy than A. So we're going to go with C as the correct answer, not D because it's going in the wrong direction. X, Y, and Z represent the successive elements neon, sodium, and magnesium. Uh, but not necessarily in that order. Okay, so we've got X, Y, Z. So these three elements, which one do we think will have the highest first ionization energy? Well, I'd be thinking uh, the noble gas. So I'd be thinking that uh, this one here would be neon, because it's the first ionization energy, and neon's going to have the highest one. And then what's the atomic number of neon? Atomic number is 10, so that's 10 protons. And then this one's the lowest one, so I'd be expecting this to be sodium, because, of course, sodium's got uh, a smaller nuclear charge than magnesium, because uh, now here we're removing the energy, the electron, from the second energy level. In these two cases, we'd be removing it from the third energy level, so it's going to be easier, because it's further from the nucleus. Uh, but it's going to be easier for sodium, because sodium's only got 11 protons, whereas magnesium is going to be trickier, because it's got 12 protons, and they're going to attract it more strongly. So, what is the order of increase in atomic number? Uh, well, Z appears to be top, then Y, and then X uh, in last. So, yeah, that'll be answer A. The highest one for the noble gas, where it's uh, trying to try to pull an electron from the second energy level. These two, where it's trying to take it from the third energy level, but this one's got less protons, so it's less strongly attracted. Okay, in this one, okay, less protons, but it's in the second energy level, not the third, closer to the nucleus. Which property increases down group one, the alkali metals? Uh, atomic radius, well, yeah, it doesn't matter what group it is, atomic radius increases. Uh, electronegativity, no, that decreases, so does that. Melting point, melting point decreases as well, because as the atoms get bigger, the metal atoms, then the, the distance between the positive nucleus and the sea of delocalized electrons decreases, so you get weaker metallic bonding. Okay, just remember again that kind of trend in that atomic radius, decreases left to right and increases top to bottom because of course you're adding a new shell each time and whatever atomic radius does electronegativity first ionization energy and electron affinity which is not represented here will they all do the opposite okay so it doesn't matter what group it is that's uh, what happens so we'll go with a Number seven, which element is a lanthanide? Well, again, grab your periodic table. Uh, so lanthanide start at 57 and then run from 58 to 71. So we've just got to identify the element which is in there, basically, which, uh, let's see if we, oh, there we go, TB. So TB is in that one. So B is going to be the right answer. Hafnium is... Where's hafnium? Hafnium's here, so hafnium's in the, the, the D block, okay, which continues after the lanthanide. So the lanthanides are this and these ones here. Uh, so hafnium's actually a transition metal in the D block. 
uh, you uranium that's an actinide because it starts with actinium so that's an actinide and then yttrium y uh, well again that's also a transition metal in the d block here so yeah that's the one we want tobium or tb whatever it is uh i can't remember what it is uh so start with the lanthanides and then we continue along there and that's where it is Ammonia is a stronger ligand than water, which is correct when concentrated aqueous solution is aqueous ammonia solution is added to dilute aqueous copper two sulfate solution. Uh, okay, so the D orbitals in the copper ion split. Well, they should be split anyway. So they split whether water is the ligand or ammonia is the ligand. So I'm not liking that one. There is a smaller splitting of the D orbitals. Well, if ammonia is a, a stronger ligand and higher in the spectrochemical series, it should cause a greater splitting rather than smaller. So I don't agree with that one. Uh, water replaces ammonia, uh, wa ammonia replaces water as the ligand. Yes, I agree with that one. It is going to, it's going to at least replace four of them anyway, because you go from copper with the six waters, uh, two plus charge, to copper with four ammonias and two waters. H2O2. And then still the two plus charge because of course it's still two neutral ligands ammonia and water uh color of the solution fades well no it becomes if anything it becomes a darker blue remember like a royal blue color so that's not going to be correct there so we're going to go with c uh, number nine how many bonding electrons are there in the urea molecule well we've got uh Four here because it's bonding electrons, not bonds. So you've got the double bond and the, uh, the double bond. So there's four electrons in total, two pairs. And then there's two here, two here. Plus you've also then got the hydrogens. So the those ones there. So it's another two, another two, another two, another two for those NH bonds. So that's two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. And uh, that looks like sixteen to me when you add them all up. Yep, that's the right answer. So again, you might have found it easier to sketch it to the side, but Obviously, remember that's four electrons, and remember the NH bonds. Uh, you've got a pair of electrons in each of those. Which does not show resonance? Uh, well, phosphate does, because it's basically this. Negative charge in each of the oxygens, and of course, in reality, then that negative charge can delocalize, and you can draw more than one valid Lewis structure. So we've got resonance. So not that one. C6H6, well that's benzene. And of course you can draw two valid Lewis structures of that depending on where you put the double bonds. So not benzene. C6H12, that's looking like the one I'll be honest. So that's the formula of an alkene or a cyclic alkane. So it could be cyclic, cyclohexane or it could be something like hexene. One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, again, there's only one valid Lewis structure. Those are not Lewis structures of each other. They're completely different molecules. So that's the one I'm looking for. Remember, all I can do with resonance is basically change the position of the, the double bonds. And then ozone, of course, well, you've got this Lewis structure and then that could be uh, where you've got this Lewis structure. Well, Lewis structure is where I add the electrons, of course. Uh, like so. Uh, and in reality, remember, with all of these resonance hybrids, the, the true structure is something more in between, where you've got uh, no proper double bond, but everything's a bit more than a single bond. And with the benzene, for example, you have the ring and so on. Uh, so this is the one here. See, and that's the first video done, 10. So I'll see you for questions 11 to 20 on the next video.